Okay, uh, welcome to today's segment of the Third Testament Foundation live stream. I found some uh, text today called World Religion and World Politics from 1969, and I thought it was very interesting. And uh, let me just read a little bit of it of the conclusion uh, before we go into uh, introducing it with some symbols. Um, in this, our little survey of the so-called Christian world, we have seen that people more and more give up their affiliation with Christianity. But something similar is also taking place in the other world religions. As the faculty of intelligence is developed, the religious instinct of beings is correspondingly weakened, and with this weakening, Beings lose their ability to believe in outdated religious ideals and are now more and more led by political ideals. What does one then understand by politics? Politics is only a variation of the religious principle. This new offshoot of the religious principle is materialistic. So, um... I, I thought it was interesting that he says this conclusion is religion and politics are identical. So it's a variation of the religious principle. So what is the religious principle? Well, it's the principle of uh, the ability to believe. And uh, if we look at this symbol, we see that um, we have it's called the eternal cosmic organic connection between God and the Son of God, one, number one, and, oh, uh, if we see these four uh, qualities here of uh, four qualities you see on the left on the screen, these four qualities here, these are the four qualities of the um, day conscious awareness of our connection to the Godhead. So at all times we can see on the, the main uh, symbol on the right, at all times we are always at one with God because that's the core of our being, right? We are right here um, in the white, X1, one with God, or one with the eternal formless, uh, nameless, unmanifest something that is, right? It's undefined, but it's alive. And it was never created, thus it will never end. So it's that which has no beginning and has no end. We're always at the core of that, at one with that. And Martinez calls it uh, X1 as a nameless variable, right? X1. That's the white. We have the purple is the creative power, and then the six colors represent the created uh, manifestations, uh, the world of form with the six uh, basic energy bodies, one for each color, right? Um, but if we look at the left over here, we see. Uh, well, if we just finish the, the brief introduction to the main symbol on the right, you can see also that there's a white ring here with uh, X1. That represents all the other living beings, X1. So they also have God at their core, right? They're also one with God, and they have the creative uh uh, ability, creative power, purple, and then the, their manifestations. So, and in this X3 world, we see what the six colors, that's where the manifestations meet each other, and that's where, that's how we can experience uh, contrast and stuff like that. That's actually life and evolution and, uh, and everything in the world form, yeah? So, <clears throat> so actually every other living being is God having a 
interaction with you and your God on the inside too. So we're actually just God talking to himself and uh, interacting with himself. And why? Well, because we, that's where there's contrast, right? In the X3 or a manifest world, that's where the contrasts are. Because if you're just experiencing at the core of your being, where you're eternal, unmanifest, there's no contrast. So there's no experience. So um, we have to have both X1, X2, the creative power, and X3, the created manifest worlds, in order to have this uh, dynamic that we call the experience of life. So uh, if we just want to look at these four qualities over here on the left, we see that in the beginning we have, uh, well, there's four triangles, right, that represent a living being. So with its x1, x2, and x3 triune principle, its eternal I, its eternal creative power, and its manifest uh, uh, forms. So x3, right? x1, x2, x3, that's the triangle. Always a living being, representing a living being in the Martinez uh, world. We see that there are four qualities, four distinct evolutionary stages of this uh, day conscious awareness of that we are in fact at one with God. In the beginning here, we have the na nature uh, religions like Native Americans and uh, I'm very primitive, Aboriginal, so whatever nature religions uh, there are, we have to see there's this uh, over uh, representation of the yellow, which means there's more feeling than intelligence, so they have a lot of belief in uh, spirits, everything is alive, but they don't really know what God is, but they know, they believe that there is <clears throat> gods everywhere. The next one over is the religious pr principle, people that are inherent of world well, religions that, that uh, go to church and stuff and and believe what the preacher is saying instead of challenging authority. Uh, but we see that there's more intelligence, but still there's an overweight of the, the a relative strength is greater of the feeling than intelligence. So this is the the, the phase or the evolutionary stage of belief, right? That is the religious principle that we're going to read about in shortly. Then we have the the uh, relative strength uh, uh, of intelligence dominating over a feeling. And we see that these beings here, their day conscious awareness of that they're one with God is non-existing because they believe that God does not exist and we call these people materialistic or atheist so they actually have the belief that God does not exist so that's their day conscious awareness of uh, that they are in fact God at the core of their being they are eternal right so then we have this fourth stage, evolutionary stage, where there is balance between the relative strength of the intelligence and feeling energies. And we see how this being here, symbolized by the triangle, perceive God as a living being, a triune principle, right? So this is the perfect connection uh, or day conscious awareness of the fact that you are in fact at all times at one with God. So, But this being here has cosmic consciousness can perceive this connection truly as it is and not in a other three stages where there's a more or less of belief uh, that of what tr the truth is. So with that in mind I think we should uh, go on reading and let me just state for the record that all symbols are copyright of the Matinas Institute and in case you have questions you can call it in or text it in and we'll take it up at the next um, live stream and uh, one life for one four six two three one seven seven always welcome to ask uh, uh, questions and also come with 
comments, or if you have topics that you want covered in these live streams, you please go ahead and text us or call it in on the voicemail. Just leave a message and we'll uh, look into it. If I can answer them, we'll see. So uh, let's just read now the text. It's almost five pages, so maybe it'll take about half hour to read through. Um, I might skip a few segments just for brevity, uh, and then you can read it on your own. <clears throat> so let's start here on uh, the mystery of daily life. For the great majority of people, the world over daily life is a mystery. Uh, for the great majority of people, the world over, daily life is a mystery. It abounds in an immense mass of riddles, but it is not the existence of these riddles alone that causes much torment and suffering. It is the it is also the attempt of many people to provide solutions to these riddles, solutions that sometimes prove to be quite wrong. These wrong solutions have, in many cases, led people into ruin because they have, in good faith, adapted their lives to them and acted accordingly. Their daily behavior has thereby become wrong. Indeed, these people have simply become derailed, which here means that they behave in a way that, even if unconsciously, makes their life, their daily life, a greater or lesser state of suffering or an unhappy fate, according to the extent and nature of their derailment. People's derailed or wrong behavior becomes evident through all their greater and smaller wars caused by their behavior between one man and another and between nations and states. We have been witness wars and revolutions with torture and death chambers, mutilations and executions without end. Indeed, we have even witnessed the authorization of murder and killing in these cases. What are we to think about the uh, destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki where thousands of people were wiped out? Not to mention all those who became lifelong invalids, were ruined and became homeless. What are we to think about all the many people born to parents in need amidst great squalor and primitivity, experiencing an unhappy or agonized fate until they die, while other people are born into opposite conditions to parents who live in wealth, luxury, and well-being. Why do some people have to place, have, why do some people have no place to lay their heads and others own uh, gigantic fortunes, indeed are multimillionaires? Why do people have to attend hospitals and build new ones despite the untiring work of doctors and science to remedy the ocean of disease with which mankind is infected? Why then do the instances of disease not decrease? Why all these destructive, mutilating and deadly wars that torture and injure mankind and turn life into an epoch of doomsday or Armageddon? It is not so surprising that life is a mystery for the people of this earth. As to the mystery of daily life, the most fundamental quest in mankind's existence is that for the solution uh, of the mystery of life. Huh. I am live. Hmm. Looked like it wasn't live. 
Anyway, excuse me, sorry about that. So, as to the mystery of daily life, the most fundamental quest in mankind's existence is that for the solution of the mystery of life. In the very primitive or unintellectual stages of mankind, this solution is no particular problem. These people's idea of life is still promoted almost exclusively by their instinct. The faculty of instinct constitutes an organic automatism through which the life of beings is promoted as long as they have not come so far in evolution as to have their faculty of intelligence developed, this faculty existing merely in a more or less latent state. So that's where we have, uh, we see how instinct energy is the red and intelligence energy is the green and we see how here there's a lot of instinct energy right here in these evolutionary stages where there's more or less primitivity and not so much intelligence energy which is uh, growing but the instinct energy is waning yeah so it is the faculty of instinct that promotes the life of plants 100 percent just as it also, to a considerable extent, promotes the life of animals. It is also this faculty that promotes all the automatic functions in the organisms of living beings. And, as we mentioned previously, it is also the faculty that automatically promotes the religious sense of the as yet unintellectual human being. The sense is the same as the faculty of feeling temporarily through the unintellectual stages that higher and mightier forms of life than those of terrestrial man exist. So instinct energy, the red civilized red color is part of this uh, ability to believe, right? But you see how it is waning to become latent in the green over here where the intelligence energy is coming so right now we are right here in the transition from the animal kingdom to the real human kingdom which is symbolized by the orange animal kingdom and the yellow real human kingdom These higher forms of life or beings were believed to rule over the powers of nature and, in fact, over people too. While instinct could make them aware that higher forms of life or beings existed, it could not make them aware of what these higher beings looked like or what form their lives took. They could only perceive the forms of life of these higher beings as an novelist, uh, Ana, 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 log, ana, that's a hard one, anoglis, ana is an ana, <laughs> excuse me, analogous <laughs> with their own forms of life. They therefore conceive these beings in their own image. They assumed that these higher beings also lived among war and combat as human beings do. They assume that there were uh, that there were evil and good beings among them as there are among human beings. And for this idea of the higher forms of life of beings stem the terms gods and devils. So we're looking at these beings here, the primitive beings, right, the first stage here with a Christian mark. They haven't discovered uh, organized religion, world religions, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, all those world religions, right? Uh, they're still in the primitive stages. So, gods and devils. There are gods and devils. The gods were the good beings, the devils were the evil beings, from whom one should fear since they were mightier than the human beings. It was therefore a matter of ingratiating oneself with the good beings, the gods. 
And this idea gave birth to the idea of an attitude to a providence. This idea and this attitude became what we today call the worship of God. The idea of the Godhead became the underlying foundation for human beings' idea of morality. This morality, in turn, gave birth to the laws for their behavior. Since this behavior was based on the being's idea of the Godhead, the same behavior was bound to be more or less imperfect according to their idea of the Godhead was more or less imperfect. How could the idea of the Godhead be imperfect when it was born in the human being's mind automatically of its instinct? All automatic functions born of the faculty of instinct in the being's organisms and in other circumstances are normally infallibly in contact with reality. This is true, but we must here bear in mind that the faculty of instinct has not given birth to a complete idea of God. It has given birth only to the being's feeling that a providence or a Godhead exists, but absolutely not what this Godhead looks like in detail or appearance. This aspect of the idea of the Godhead is created by the beings still very primitive, imperfect, or unintellectual faculty of imagination. That is, an ability whose results are neither intellectual nor intuitive. These imaginings about the Godhead, which the beings have created by virtue of this ability, are thus unintellectual and therefore to a greater or lesser extent unreal. So these are the beings, they have this question mark, they're imagining this, what is the Godhead, right? So it's based on instinct and not intuition. So we know the intuition is symbolized by the blue, right? Which is way over here. Instinct red down here. So instinct is a, a much higher frequency, not activated yet in these beings. Thus the religious principle stage. The beings idea of the Godhead and their ensuing morality and behavior were thus based on more or less unreal or false imaginings in relation to the absolute real or cosmic truth or solution of the mystery of life. It lies entirely beyond what a human being with his faculty to experience life born merely by his instinct and imagination can perceive and understand. The being's idea of morality was born of the inner idea of the existence of higher beings, gods and devils. It is this instinctive idea of the existence of higher beings that we today call religious belief. So here he defines religious belief. Yeah? The instinctive idea of the existence of higher beings. This belief is the guiding star for the morality and behavior of all peoples as long as they are quite unintellectual and have to base their life on the faculties of instinct, gravity, and imagination. So again here, gravity is the gravity energy being symbolized by the orange, right? The killing principle. So we see that human beings at the primitive or unintellectual stages in, in evolution. So when he says unintellectual, it doesn't. It's not just that the beings here do not have uh, intelligence energy. It's it's they they do not have uh, intelligence energy so much. They have some. If we see right here, it's where most people are, and the end of the animal kingdom, waiting to get into the real human kingdom. There is some energy, uh, intelligence energy, here you see the green color, but it is also uh, because they're, they're unintellectual, because they do not have this uh, intuition energy activated. So and why do they have that? That's because they don't have enough uh, ennobled feeling energy uh, to activate this uh, intuition body. So that's what 
Latinos defines as unintellectual. So there's not enough noble feeling or a lot of energy uh, combined with this intelligence energy to have the intuition active. So we see that human beings at the primitive or unintellectual stages in evolution exactly like the animals are guided by their instinct. There is only the difference that the animals are unconscious of this guidance. They are not guided by any religious belief. Their instinct guides them to do what is for them a vital necessity. So animals, right, they don't have religious belief. They only have instinct. Humans have, however, developed their faculty of thought so that they are able to form ideas about the life in which they live. Even, in, even if these ideas at the primitive stages are quite unintellectual and thereby to a greater or less extent mistaken. It is this incorrectness that shows us the primitivity or unfinished state of their source. What is really true in the lives of these beings was thus only their instinctive idea of the presence of a higher power. What was more or less untrue was the ideas or descriptions produced by the beings on intellectual faculty of imagination of the appearance and daily lives of this higher power in the form of gods and devils. It was a matter of course that they could not conceive of the daily lives of these gigantic beings as being different from their own lives apart from their appearing in a state that fulfilled all the dreams they dreamt but could not fulfill in their own lives. Thus arose an ideal to which the human beings could adjust their lives. These ideals must of course be a glorification of the killing principle since this principle is the ruling principle of life in the animal kingdom and likewise in that aspect of the mentality of the unfinished human being we call the animal in the human. We have a good example of this idealization of man of the killing principle in our Nordic mythology in which the highest ideal was to kill and to be killed. Otherwise one would not get to Valhalla, the paradise of this mythology. People lived among war, theft, plundering, killing, and oppression of one another, and the greater one's prowess in this direction, the greater the favor in which one was held by the gods. That this existence of killing had to give birth to multitude of sufferings is a matter of course. As the suffering gave birth as the suffering give birth to the humane faculty in human beings, which in turn means the faculty of feeling sympathy or love, all these killings or the murderous behavior came to offend against this new state of feeling in the beings. And they began to imagine new ideas that better suited their incipient faculty of sympathy or neighborly love. These imaginings were formed in new laws for behavior preached by world redeemers and the so-called world religions arose. So here we are at the second stage, right? World religions, organized religion, which takes us out of the barbaric stage. Here in the West, it was the Christian world religion that came to be the dominating one. In this world religion, the ideal of love is nothing less that, than that one should love God above all things and one's neighbor as oneself. Furthermore, it states that one should forgive one's neighbor not merely seven times a day, but seventy times seven times a day. And actually, if you do the math here, it's uh, 70 times 7 is 490 times a day. I believe it's a, every 2 minutes or something, 24 hours a day. So that's kind of often. Whatsoever one would that others 
should do to one, one should first do to them. Put up again your sword in its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So that's the vengeance, the revenge thing there. <clears throat> But are these ideals now strictly observed by the peoples of the West? Certainly not. As the observance of these ideals is the absolute condition for the creation of a real or absolute peace on Earth, where all war, massacre, theft, plundering, and oppression, execution, hate, and revenge are impossibilities, it is not so surprising that people even though they call themselves Christians, live in war, Armageddon, and suffering. Why do the followers of the Christian religion not live by the strongly prescribed ideals of their religion? How can it be that the so-called Christian peoples are up to now the cleverest warriors in the world? Why do they not love their neighbors as themselves? Why do they not do to other people that they would like to have done to them? Why do they not observe the command to put the sword in its sheath, but on the contrary, use not only the sword, but furthermore have, by virtue of their mastery of atomic forces, multiplied millions upon millions of times their ability to kill, destroy, and mutilate? Why are there ever more and more empty seats during services in the Christian churches? Why are more and more people becoming materialistic or godless? Why do people not do everything possible to fulfill the Christian ideals through which they would attain the absolute peace that they in reality all wish? In order to understand man's situation, we must go back and take a brief look at the mentality of those to whom the Christian ideals were given. Of what sort was the mentality of these people before they became subject to the preaching of the Christian ideals? <clears throat> it was of such a nature that it naturally could not accept these highly elevated ideals to their full extent. By virtue of their religious instinct, they were aware that beings higher than human beings existed. Right? So that's here, the first stage, right? And they could likewise also accept that an almighty God existed. They could easily accept these things. Here their instinct helped them and promoted their unshakable belief in this one almighty God. And since they were tired of the killing religion of Valhalla, they were also to a certain extent susceptible to the humanity or neighborly love that the Christian ideas prescribed. But we have since seen that they were not at all all able to live by these ideals. They could neither love their neighbors as themselves, nor refrain from getting involved in war or from killing. Finally, they lost faith in these ideals. Then, they formed the idea that people could not fulfill these ideals. It was only the world redeemer Christ who could fulfill them. They then began to interpret or form these ideals in such a way as to make them better suit the behavior they were able to achieve. They introduced the idea of the forgiveness of sins, which, could, which they could obtain by virtue of the crucifixion of Jesus, imagining this as a punishment for the sins of man taken upon himself by the world redeemer, the innocent being. By praying for the grace, repentant people could then be freed from the effects of the evil they had committed. That this modification of the Christian world ideals could not 
to any significant extent inspire people to get away from the killing ideals of the past is a matter of course. So therefore, in some situations they bless war and its murderous weapons and hellish machines. And the world today must live among the wars and massacres and the religious chaos and godlessness of an Armageddon. But this is in reality nothing other than the fulfillment of the epoch of doomsday prophesied by Christ himself. What is the meaning of this epoch of doomsday that the world has seen in the wars and revolutions of the 20th century? What kind of horror was it that we saw during the Second World War's campaigns of conquest Conquest concentration camps with their torture and gas chambers, starvation, and other processes of culminating horror and racial persecution inflicted on defenseless people, children, as well as adults, old, as well as young. Was not this entire epoch of doomsday a total ignoring of all cosmic Christian ideals? Was it not? a practicing of a culminating breach of the same divine ideals. It was a world of culminating anti-Christianity that here in the 20th century was revealed in the flesh for the people of the earth. It was a demonstration in matter, flesh and blood of what happens in a world of highly intelligent people who do not use their gifts to fulfill the Christian ideals as they were preached directly by the world redeemer but on the contrary used their gifts to create an extreme breach of precisely these highest cosmic ideals of life. Without the observance of these ideals no being whatsoever can come to experience the absolute real life which is the same as the eternal peace and ensuing happiness and bliss. Why could Christian world ideals not have prevented man from getting into this anti-Christianity, this state of doomsday or hell? They could not. And it is also evident that it has never been their purpose to prevent this. The epoch of doomsday or anti-Christianity of our century. It is true that Christian ideals were given to man almost 2,000 years ago, but just as the physical or material world cannot possibly be made fertile by sunshine alone, so the mental or spiritual continent of mankind can just as little be made fertile and living by mental or spiritual sunshine alone. Sunshine on its own turns continents into deserts. Just as the physical soil must be provided with nutrients and water in order, together with the warmth and light of the sun, to produce a fertile plant, animal, and human life, so too must the mental or spiritual soil of mankind be equipped with water and nutrients, together with mental or spiritual sunshine. That is, the highest wisdom or cosmic signs. In order to be able to unfold the totally perfect growth and vigor that constitute cosmic consciousness and turn its source into the perfect human being in God's image after his likeness. So we see here this highest wisdom cosmic signs being the spiritual sunshine that we need. Yeah? The mentality of man cannot be changed by guidance alone. In order for guidance to have any meaning for a being's behavior, that being must have precisely had a certain amount of experience in the area in question. And it is those questions uh, that can arise in such a field of experience that the being can have answered through guidance. As regards being able to accept the world redeemer's high ideals of neighborly love, mankind did not have the area of experiences that could make it totally susceptible to these ideals. 
and it is this area mankind is experiencing through its sufferings which have reached a culmination in the form of the epoch of doomsday. All the sufferings mankind has already gone through and the sufferings still remaining for it to experience will give birth in mankind to the faculty of humaneness which will make the ideals of Christ or the highest cosmic analysis of life of immediate importance. So, why is people not interested in the Third Testament? Well, because they need to have the experiences of suffering enough. They need to have enough experiences in order for them to crave the Third Testament. Religion and politics are identical. In this, our little survey of the so-called Christian world, we have seen that people more and more give up their affiliation to Christianity. But something similar is also taking place in the other world religions. As the faculty of intelligence is developed, the religious instinct of beings is correspondingly weakened. And with this weakening, beings lose their ability to believe in outdated religious ideals and are now more and more led by political ideals. So this is the beings now that uh, have outlived this religious religious principle, right? And now they're using intelligence in a religious manner, right? And become politicians. So the politics is the new religion and what does one then understand by politics? Politics is only a variation of the religious principle. This new offshoot of the religious principle is materialistic. It keeps mainly to ordinary physical ideals, the improvement of forms of government and social conditions, the improvement of culture and the creation of public amenities, care for invalids and old people to a great extent, it promotes education and health services and many other cultural amenities and the like, as well as the police and judicial system and thereby law and order in the state or nation, as well as connections with other countries, exports and imports, military agreements and contracts. We see here that this variation of religiousness is a much more active even if it is more materialistic than religion. While religion is promoted more by instinct, politics is, on the contrary, promoted by intelligence. So this is the big difference, right? It is thus the faculty of intelligence that has created the new variation of religiousness. It had to be developed before the humane faculty could be developed, since this could be developed and grow, or be given birth to only by the experiences of suffering. But the fact that beings thus gained intelligence before they got any particular faculty of humaneness or neighborly love had the effect that they became experts in the unfolding or of darkness or the animal principle to such an excessive degree that they came to appear as beings who were neither animals nor perfect human beings we have here before us the beings with devil consciousness this devil consciousness had in turn the effect that the strongest people could oppress the weakest. And life in reality became shaped by the principle of the right of the stronger, even though a legal and judicial system was created. But since the epoch of doomsday is thus a vital necessity for beings' evolution towards becoming perfect beings of love, we see the emergence of a divine world plan and the many social amenities that politics has created and of which it will continue to create more and more are thus the incipient humane fruits of the horrors of doomsday. Of doomsday. We see that the politics of one country 
can no longer be isolated from those of other countries, but becomes more and more tied together with the politics of these other countries. And politics thus becomes world politics. It is the effects of this world politics we see in the form of uh, the United Nations Organization and all the many political unions in the form of business, in the form of agreements about tourism, in the form of agreements about peace, and many, many other forms of unions and cooperation. The world is already about to become a United Nation in which all nations, the superpowers as well as the small nations, are provinces. The upheavals in Africa, Asia, China, and so on are merely links in the creation of that balance into which all states must ultimately come in relation to one another. That this cannot take place without war and suffering is due to beings' lack of humaneness. But it is precisely this they develop through their warlike attitude and lack of understanding and knowledge about the divine world plan. There's no reason for these for those people who will not make war to worry about their future in as far as they themselves live without murdering and killing animals and human beings. One must here remember that it is no vital necessity for man to kill animals in order to live. We are, we are thus witnessing the completion of a great divine plan for mankind. It is led gradually forwards towards an increasing evolution of humaneness or love that will turn the world into one state, one people, one nation. All of this will be such an extraordinarily great benefit to mankind that it will far exceed what it has the imagination to grasp today. Every human being will be a joint owner of the earth. No capitalists, no superiors, and no subordinates, no businesses, no need for money. So the problem today is, right, we have this uh, unjust, uh, unrighteous distribution system where the few gets way more than less you get, and the many gets hardly anything. So in this new uh, United States of the world there is a fair and righteous distribution system, right? So everyone will be protected by everyone else. Everyone will love everyone else. The basic tone of the universe, love, will have become the daily atmosphere of life in the world state the working capacity of the, of the human being will, in the state of the future, be the same as what a million uh, in assets is today. So, like, what that means is we're all going to be millionaires, right? Having a millionaire lifestyle. Everyone. But world politics will also promote materialistic science, and humanity will promote spiritual science or cosmology, so that materialistic science and the science of intuition, the cosmic analysis, will be united in one great divine science, and the world state will be the new paradise on earth, or the kingdom of heaven. People will thus come to experience paradise even on the physical plane of existence, and the prodigal son will again be united with his father. And that is the real human kingdom, symbolized by the yellow color, which entrances this star, which symbolizes cosmic consciousness or the activation of birth of the intuition body, right? Which is activated by neighborly love. So, how do we become more loving? Well, suffering makes us loving and humane. So, we are on this path towards the real human kingdom, paradise on earth, heaven on earth, and inevitably we will reach the star.
and be back day consciously aware of that we are in fact at one with God. And that's today's uh, segment and I uh, hope to see you soon. <clears throat> Take care.